Our guests are connecting at the moment. Merhabalar, hoş geldiniz. Bir iki dakika içinde başlayacağız. Şu anda. Hello, good morning. We will be starting in a couple of minutes. We still have participants joining us. We just kindly ask you to wait a couple of more minutes and then we will be starting. Hoş geldiniz tekrar yeni gelenler için. So for those of you who recently joined us, I'd like to welcome you all. I think we can start in a couple of minutes because we still have people showing up. Tekrar hoş geldiniz yeni gelenler için. Hala yoğun bir şekilde geliyor misafirleriniz. O yüzden biraz oyalanıyoruz. Kusura bakmayın. There are still a long list of people showing up. And meanwhile, as the co-hosts, we keep them in the line. By the way, the webinar will be both in English and in Turkish. And there will be simultaneous interpretation between the two languages. If you want to follow the webinar in one language, you can pick one of the languages in the languages section, you can click on the globe icon at the bottom of the screen and choose the interpretation channel. But if you understand both languages, you may remain on the floor as well. It's five past now. I think we can start. Welcome. Good afternoon. A quick reminder about languages. The webinar will be held both in Turkish and in English. If you want to follow the webinar through interpretation in one language, you can click on the globe icon at the bottom of the screen and choose the language of your preference. You can choose the translation to English from the uh, translation icon below. Tekrar hoş geldiniz. Biraz da tercümelere geçiş için bekliyorum. 
Sanırım başlayabiliriz. I think we can start now. Hello, this is Cansu Ilhan. I work for Can Europe. Together with the Confederation of Progressive Trade Unions of Turkey, Hakkish Trade Union Confederation, Confederation of Public Employees Unions, and Confederation of Turkish Trade Unions, we wanted to organize this webinar to talk about just transition to climate neutrality. We wanted to get together the stakeholders of just transition, being the trade unions and NGOs, to talk about what we have in hand. And we wanted to elaborate on the existing need for transformation in the industries that we work in. And of course, we also want to uh, provide a joint study so that no one is left behind. This is just an initial webinar to understand each other's perspectives. And we hope that this is going to be the beginning of a series of events in which we will bring together different stakeholders of this issue and talk about the issue at length. So we have more than two and a half hours and we will have different parts in our program. In the first part, we'll be listening to the welcoming statements of the Turkish trade unions. And in the second part, we will have uh, participants from the International Trade Union uh, Confederation and European Trade Union Confederation and also Ken. And in the third part, we will listen to the comments of the experts from the four confederations. And finally, we have a part for uh, questions and answers and we'll be listening to our participants and also guests. So let me remind you of the game rules. Uh, please keep your mics off all the time if you're not speaking. You can ask your questions at the end of the uh, webinar in the Q&A session. But of, of course, if you have questions to the speakers, meanwhile, you can ask your questions on the chat box. So I've been told that my voice is not very high. I'm going to increase it now. I think everyone can hear me now. So on our agenda, we have a list of uh, confederations that will deliver their welcoming speeches. Uh, we will start by Mr. Mehmet Çetin from uh, Confederation of Turkish Trade Unions because he has to leave. Well, thank you very much. I asked for a change of order because I have to attend a different meeting. Thank you very much for your understanding. Greetings to all of you. So at the beginning of my remarks, I'd like to extend my greetings and respect to each and every one of you. I hope you can hear me well. Yes, please go ahead. Thank you for the confirmation. As you all know, one of the most important issues on our global agenda is the uh, fight against climate change. Climate change is a natural course of our planet, but since the industrial revolution, we have been using fossil fuels more and we have been destroying nature to a, a larger extent. Therefore, climate change is getting faster. Because of the increase, increases in global temperatures, uh, there are natural events more frequently happening now, like floods and wildfires. And these natural disasters cause loss of life and, of course, loss of uh, economic assets. With climate change, temperatures are rising and there is increasing uh, temperature stress. I think we have to consider this as uh, a threat to working conditions because as temperatures increase, uh, injuries and maybe fatalities will increase uh, under working conditions. Because of the heat stress, by 2030, 72 million equivalent of um, full-time jobs will be lost. In uh, industries like agriculture, construction, 
workers will have less access to social protection and healthy working conditions. Energy, industry, and transportation are uh, sectors where similar risks are uh, possible. With heat waves, there will be more uh, power cuts and white collar workers will have uh, limited access to air conditioning services. The effects of climate change on the uh, working market or labor market is not only related to having access to energy sources, there will be direct impacts on livelihoods as well, especially in the industries like agriculture, fisheries, because the ecosystems that depend on these, uh, uh, that feed those uh, industries will be largely affected by increasing temperatures and the climate change. Additionally, energy, water, transportation, and telecommunication sectors will potentially be affected by floods or drought and breakdowns because of other natural disasters. This will create other economic losses and uh, job losses. Preventing climate change and adaptation policies will have impacts on uh, the labor conditions because with policies on reducing carbon emissions, many businesses and industries uh, will be facing uh, shrinkages. And while we'll be losing some jobs in certain areas, uh, there will be new jobs created in greener uh, industries, actually. But of course, uh, this brings about new problems like training uh, the workers for the uh, new jobs and new skills. So there's a big question mark about how this is going to happen. In a nutshell, in all industries that require transition, there will be job losses. But throughout the process, we have to protect the health and safety of the workers, and we have to prevent job losses in the affected sectors. We need strong policies for that. Also, changes brought about by climate change vary from region to another region. Therefore, the needs for adaptation uh, also are closely related with uh, the uh, potentials and resources of specific regions. Climate change will have great impact on uh, industries, on the job market, and uh, there are scientific uh, evidence of that. Greenhouse gas emissions are the main contributors to climate change, and greenhouse gas emissions are mainly uh, created by uh, developed and developing countries, but of course, uh, underdeveloped countries will be affected. They are already fighting against poverty and other problems, and they will be uh, on top of that facing the problems created by climate change as well. Climate change is an interdisciplinary area. Its existence is undeniable. Preventing the effects of climate change require the development of international policies. On 6th of October 2021, uh, Turkey ratified the Paris Agreement in its parliament. And according to Turkey's uh, commitment, we have to uh, cut down our uh, carbon emissions in order to uh, keep global temperature increases lower than 2%, and if possible, uh, by 1.5%. 180 countries submitted their uh, national climate plans, and fighting against climate change has become a real global struggle. European Commission set out targets for, for 2030, and according to these targets, uh, they want to limit greenhouse gas emissions to 55% compared to pre-industrial levels. The European Union also 
came up with uh, different mechanisms like the carbon border adjustment mechanism and carbon border tax. So by 2023, uh, these mechanisms will be fully implemented as well. To be climate neutral, uh, we need total mobilization by the industry. All goods and services should be produced based on a circular economy and based on certain standards. Sustainable production policies require also potentials for reducing waste. I think with new digital technologies, we have necessary instruments to meet our targets. In order to strengthen the industries and its workers, we have to come up with a needs analysis and we have to create a industrial networks. For instance, some industries will be facing a change more than other industries like coal mining. I think we have to come up with specific strategies for carbon intensive industries like that. So for people who work in those industries, we have to come up with policies uh, to leave no one behind and uh, to create decent jobs for them. For the people working in the industries that will be directly uh, implement, uh, impacted by climate change, we have to uh, create uh, instruments like social dialogue and uh, new job conditions and new training. I think uh, we have to work on uh, training programs for uh, skills development. We have to shorten working hours for those who will be working under heavy conditions. And maybe we can increase the number of shifts so that more people can work. And of course, we have to be careful about not creating new inequalities. This uh, transition should be done with due care so that no one is left behind. While combating climate change, we also try to uh, build a just world. There are existing inequalities around the world. Capital is not, or uh, wealth is not shared properly. According to UNHCR, people Uh, the richest 1% uh, of the world population uh, emits 175% more uh, carbon emissions than the poorest 1%. So it means that we all lead to uh, carbon emissions, but of course, uh, climate change will uh, sharpen the edge of uh, the injustice. Therefore, we have to fight. because it's the poorest who will be uh, affected more by the effects of climate change. It, not only the poor, but also the disadvantaged parts of the society, like the disabled people and uh, young people and women. We as trade unions have to focus on the fact that no one should be left behind for uh, the transition to be just. The strategies to be implemented should be human focused and it should, they should have a social dimensions as well. Policy should be developed by taking into account working conditions. The effects of greenhouse gas emissions that we emit and the answer, the response by the NGOs, the trade unions and the governments will be shaping the future of our planet. I think we have to create strong policies, we have to invest in uh, training programs for reskilling, and we have to uh, rearrange working hours accordingly. As Turkish, the Confederation of Turkish Trade Unions, we believe that for a just transition, uh, adaptation policies and mitigation policies should be developed, and we will take part in all these efforts in the future as well. My final remarks go as follows. As Confederation of Turkish Trade Unions, we strongly hope that the cost of cleaning this 
planet or cleaning the pollution should not be paid only by the workers who have the least contribution to greenhouse gas emissions or climate change. We should not be the scapegoats. We should not be the only ones uh, paying for the costs. So as the Confederation of Turkish Trade Unions, we would like to extend our deepest greetings to all of you again. And I'd like to thank all the organizers for inviting us to this event. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mehmet Bey. Now I would like to leave the floor to the Secretary General of Confederation of Progressive Trade Unions, uh, Mr. Adnan Bey, please take over. Hello. I hope you hear me all right. Yes, we hear you, Adnan Bey. Please go ahead. Have a nice day, everyone. On behalf of the Confederation of Progressive Trade Unions, I'd like to extend my gratitude and regards. Um, I am disturbed by the order of the speeches. Um, also, I think there has been uh, some discomfort uh, caused by this order of speeches. Getting to the subject, I suppose that the world is facing an unprecedented crisis, which no one can ignore. And it's an uh, urgent matter to resolve. I'm the Secretary General of DISC and the head of uh, the union, uh, the, the labor union of um, metal employees. It's an emergency for us as well. The establishment of the Renewable Energy Support Platform and other platforms and initiatives have involved various NGOs and civil organizations also where I was involved in the process. We have been trying to take measures. In the past, when we spoke about the climate crisis, it seemed to many people that we were speaking about a remote problem that was in the distant future. But today, when we look at our daily lives, we can see the effects of uh, the climate change, obviously, and uh, rather clearly, and we experience these results. The Konya Plateau, which is one of the most important grain hubs of Turkey, and other uh, agricultural areas are no longer suitable for agricultural activities. There's a lot of drafts. This summer, we saw many examples of wildfires in forests, many peasants and farmers had to leave their homes where they were making their bread. These are only a few examples of the results of climate change. Moving one step away to check what the actual reason behind this crisis is, we can see, believe me, that it's just the ambition to make money, to make profit of a handful of capitalists. That's the only reason why. Let me give you a simple example. Since 1988, globally, the greenhouse gas emissions have been created by more than 70% by only 100 fossil fuel organizations. The only way that they will remain alive is that they make profit. That's why they only think about profit and nothing else, which is why they exploit labor and nature without any borders or limits. That's what capitalism does, and that's what we should expect of it, nothing else. Focusing more on production based on consumption, we should get rid of the capitalistic system as soon as possible. Perhaps this will free us of our own extinction, only thanks to ridding ourselves of capitalism, it might be possible. When the climate crisis is affecting us this way, the segment of uh, different segments of capital are, of course, 
trying to lead the process towards their own interests to survive workers need to sell their labor they have no other way millions of employees are being shown to be responsible for this crisis or even the biggest obstacle standing between the solution to climate crisis and us and they are trying to place the burden on workers for instance in our country the president erdogan is still full of appetite for neoliberalistic policies the former kemal dervish the former uh, minister of finance kemal dervish in a text he shared was asking what was the reason in front of the climate crisis and he gave the answer it's the workers the worker class it's just like them saying there's no other alternative but globalization today they have neoliberalistic solutions that they're producing thinking that there's no other way out only their solution is the way out or nothing else is realistic that's what they are trying to emphasize at every opportunity that they get they're pushing their own agenda against the climate crisis threatening employees and workers with their own jobs and blaming them of the situation where the world finds itself in pushing workers to make a choice between their jobs and the current status. The working class, if, if we are able to work or uh, to think about an independent program for them, might be the only way out. Otherwise, workers will be announced as the main responsible party for the climate crisis, as we can see. Draft and other similar problems that we know of and experience closely, and the transformation against climate crisis are going to have a direct impact on us. They will have repercussions on our lives. For instance, European Union is the most important export market for Turkey, and they have a border uh, tax uh, imposed uh, for carbon, impacting automotive, steel and iron, cement and other manufacturing sectors. EU countries from internal combustion engine sales is moving, uh, are moving away rapidly, which is thanks to a brand new technology, which requires less labor, transitioning to powered cars, electrical powered cars. This will have a direct impact uh, on the automotive industry, which will have to transform completely structurally. Also moving away from coal, is going to introduce a brand new uh, energy policy for Turkey. On the other hand, in coal mining and thermal plants, tens of thousands of employees are working and their lives and their future are vague to discuss now. This is an important discussion topic. How are they going to remain uh, alive? How will they survive? The bosses, until now didn't share their profits with automotive employees or steel and iron employees. If they haven't shared the profits, then they uh, shouldn't have all the burden taken by the employees either. This is where we care, why we care about the just transition, but we can see that everyone has a different understanding of what is just. In Turkey, we have been managed, we have been ruled by a party that has the word justice in it for many years now. And as employees, we have been craving for justice for many, many years now, just because, because uh, the name is used in the uh, name of the party. It doesn't mean that the concept really ap applies. Uh, there's nothing fair in the program for the working class people or the work working group. Some people 
only think about more incentives for the capital and more concessions from employees, which is why we believe that there should be an independent program for workers. And that's the only way we can have a just transitioning. So what do I mean by an independent just program for workers? For instance, the transitioning that we mentioned earlier, which is probably going to cause losses of jobs, it could be compensated by radically shortening the working hours of workers. At the moment, we have 45 to 50 hours of working periods on a weekly basis. Uh, labor unions that are attached to this uh, have proposed that these working hours were lowered to 37.5 hours. With the climate issue at hand, this has become even more vital in terms of creating employment and also in terms of exploiting nature less. These are key. In the past, when these demands were mentioned, these were regarded as uh, uh, surrealistic. That's what they said. But today, the world is facing such an urgent threat. And when we are facing such an emergency, the opposite of this cannot be even considered. It's not rational to defend the opposite of what we are defending. There's no recommendation that is more realistic or more based on facts. And we believe that the most important uh, element here be, uh, will be to uh, act for the public. When we look at what's happening over the past weeks, we can see that people are having a hard time trying to keep their houses warm. Industrial organizations are shutting down because there's no power, there's no energy. People are limiting their use of energy because of the increased costs and uh, companies are closing down because of lack of energy. Over the past two decades, there have been a lot of privatizations in uh, energy. Was this the promise? They gave us stories about how uh, we would be self-sufficient thanks to privatizations. These were not real, we can see now. They're buying power from the state for two kurush and selling it to the people for two liras. They're making incredible amounts of profits and they're making the climate crisis a justification for their demand that the infrastructure be remodernized. And we need to see that this should be also an important element of and the just and urgent uh, transformation program for the uh, working people. There are three main problems in Turkey at the moment. First of all, we have a deprivation of energy. Millions of employees are unable to access energy, especially after the recent raises in the prices. This is actually causing losses of lives. Number two, in mines and in the distribution and uh, generation of power, employees are working in conditions that are harmful to health. Number three, there's energy generation, sorry, uh, transformation that is required by climate change. These three needs are intertwined and they are complementary to one another. The solution to all three would be that the entire energy infrastructure be publicized again and we need to ensure occupational safety to all the employees and make sure that a certain degree of energy is offered free of charge uh, to households. And we need to do our best to fight against climate change. I have kept the examples limited, but let me repeat what we discussed earlier. In the face of the transformation program of the capital, the working people 
uh, need an urgent program that is independent and this will be the only real just uh, transformation program this meeting is key for establishing such a program and I hope that it's going to serve the purposes of uh, this meeting. And I'd like to thank everyone who was involved in uh, organizing this event and being instrumental in doing this. Thank you so much, Adnan Bey. Uh, and thank you very much for your speech. And now I'd like to leave the floor to Adnan Sadan Geçti, the Deputy Secretary General of the Confederation of Turkish Real Trade Unions. Konfederasyon adına saygıyla selamlıyorum tüm katılımcıları. Sesim geliyor umarım. Geliyor Erdoğan Bey. Evet. Öncelikle toplantının düzenlenmesi de emeği geçin. Well, first of all, I'd like to thank the organizers. Congratulations. As Hakiş Trade Union Confederation, we focus on sustainable development and a growth strategy, which is sensitive to nature and environment. And when we look at the decisions that we take in our General Assembly, you will see that most of them have some environmental concerns. That's why I'd like to thank you for inviting us to this meeting. On our last General Assembly, the 14th General Assembly, we have certain decisions related to environment. The first one is to raise awareness about the environment and to develop effective and sustainable policies about the environment. Secondly, we have a decision about fighting against desertification and another decision on food security and access to clean water and food as a human as a basic human right. And another decision is about using local and domestic assets without destroying the environment and an energy policy, which is based on this fact. So this shows us the fact that our confederation focuses on sustainable development and green transition and green growth. We are very happy to be part of uh, these efforts. As Hakish, we conducted a very important activity. As we all know, carbon emissions contribute greatly to climate change. And with the effect of greenhouse gases emitted into the atmosphere, we have increasing temperatures. After our General Assembly, we initiated a campaign for donating trees. As you know, in official ceremonies, uh, people uh, present uh, plagues or tokens of appreciation to participants or to speakers. Uh, and we decided to start uh, giving trees as a present, actually, because, as you know, trees absorb carbon dioxide and they, they release oxygen. I think planting trees and uh, forestation activities will contribute to fighting against uh, climate change. Another important natural asset is water. We can't do without water. If we cannot find bread, we can eat cake, but we can't replace water with anything. We can't replace it with soda or with uh, juices. So in a nutshell, water is an important asset and our confederation runs some campaigns uh, for people to have access to clean water. Around 700 million people around the world cannot have access to clean water and more than 2 million people die because they cannot have access to clean water. They die of diseases they catch from uh, polluted waters. So. As Hakish, we run certain campaigns to help people uh, to have access to clean water. But of course, the main topic of our meeting is just transition. We are discussing just transition for climate neutrality. So 
I got uh, inspired by what uh, Adnan Bey uh, said. Yes, there is carbon emissions around the world, but which countries emit the highest amount of carbon? Uh, in fact, the main contributors to carbon emissions are the developed countries and developing countries. Uh, primarily China, United States and European Union countries altogether uh, emit 50% of the carbon, followed by India, Russia, Japan are the other contributors to carbon emissions. There are also companies. I want to give some names actually. Starting of 1965 to 2010, a measurement was done. Uh, it's a US-based Climate Accountability Institute, which made this calculation. One third of the carbon emitted globally uh, were emitted by 20 companies, Gazprom, ExxonMobil, BP, Shell are uh, the main names that we see. We also have uh, Abu Dhabi National Oil, Kuwait Petroleum Corporation, or Iraq National Oil. So altogether, 20 companies are responsible for 50% of the emissions. So how are we going to ensure just transition? I think the only way to ensure just transition is to have those companies bear the costs of just transition. So just like in every crisis, it is the people who are not responsible for the prices uh, to pay the cost, actually. So if you make uh, the people who have no responsibility for the crisis pay the costs, then it won't be a just transition. In Turkey, for instance, we have a similar, similar struggle, actually, and we try to uh, get help from our international partners. That's why it's great to see participants from uh, ITUK and ETUK in our meeting. Uh, globally, uh, the, laborers, the laborers can only leave the table with a winning hand is thanks to solidarity and support from uh, international peers. I, th I think we can relate this to uh, carbon emissions as well because uh, in order to ensure just transition, we will have to change certain industries and some uh, sectors will have to shut down, some sectors will have to narrow down. And of course, uh, we should not make the workers in those industries pay for the costs. I think we should adopt certain policies so that uh, it will be the polluters who pay. I know that in Turkey, there are certain efforts by the ministry I checked the website of the ministry. They have a questionnaire. Uh, they started the consultation process to draw up a roadmap, actually. This is a very good initiative taken by the ministry. But I think uh, this roadmap should be drawn in consultation with the experts from the NGOs, from uh, the academic world. And I think these efforts should be coordinated by scientists. As you know, we are hit by a global pandemic of COVID-19. And in Turkey, we have a scientific board uh, to lead the country's policies in terms of uh, COVID-19 prevention. Just like in the healthcare sector, we can also establish uh, a committee or a board of experts for the roadmap for just transition as well, so that the costs will not have to be paid by the working class. I also want to say a few words about renewable energy sources. In Turkey, we are currently suffering from an energy crisis. So 
natural gas is the main source of energy that we use to generate electricity and to heat the houses and the industry. But we are not a producer of natural gas. However, Turkey is quite rich and has a great potential in terms of renewable sources like solar power and wind power. And although Turkey has a greater potential than the European Union countries in terms of solar power, uh, only 3% of uh, power is generated by using uh, solar power. I think we can build on that potential. Another re renewable resource is water. We have hydroelectricity power plants, but because of uh, droughts and because of uh, climate change, I think uh, the potential for hydroelectricity power plants to generate electricity will go down in the future. Therefore, I think we should stick to uh, solar power and wind power. Uh, the labor movement workers are faced with two restrictions. One is green transition, and the second one is digital transition. As you know, uh, just transition will require use of uh, new technologies and digital techno technologies. We've already started seeing use of those technologies intensively in certain sectors, and soon uh, some uh, industries uh, will disappear actually because of uh, being replaced by digital ways of doing business. Therefore, I think we should uh, come up with uh, new policies of adaptation. Uh, the confederations and trade unions in Turkey reached the consensus in an earlier meeting to establish a transition fund. So, as you know, there will be carbon taxes and our products will be uh, imposed carbon taxes on the borders. So I think nationally, we have to establish a, trans, a transition fund so that those who suffer losses because of carbon taxes and carbon uh, adaptation uh, can be supported. And this fund can be also made international and uh, the contributors to climate change can pay for the costs. Well, thank you very much. Now, I'd like to uh, give the floor to Shukran Kablan Yeshil, the co-president of Confederation of Public Employees Unions. Have a nice day. And I'd like to salute you on behalf of the Confederation of Public Employees Unions. And of course, I'd like to thank the European uh, Confederation of Labor Unions, uh, as well, and all my colleagues. The previous speakers touched upon many points. Uh, there are many points that we already you know, agree with, but uh, there are also those that we disagree with. As Yes, I think we believe that we should first take a snapshot picture of the current status in Turkey and then we can discuss the solutions because as we're speaking about the just transitioning, uh, we also need to uh, uh, consider the capitalistic systems, the climate policies and the results that are created by the owners of large capital. And then we can uh, talk about the possible recommendations for success, which is why as we discuss fair transitioning, first we need to take a snapshot picture of the current status. As everyone discussed earlier very clearly, this is a humanitarian crisis, the climate crisis that is putting us in a situation where we are actually seeing results such as the COVID-19 pandemic that is causing uh, losses of hundreds of lives each day. And we are also facing other uh, epidemics. We should consider the fact that we are going to face further epidemics uh, if we continue with this imbalance. Also, there is imbalance in um, 
equity socially. It's, it's very obvious and clear that the economic crisis is not impacting the owners of capital. Uh, class inequality itself, as discussed earlier by uh, my counterpart apart from this, uh, impacts the working class, uh, causing further poverty, which is why uh, ecological crisis itself is making uh, the inequity among classes more profound, worsening the status. Likewise, access to clean food and water is becoming more and more difficult because of the ecological crisis. It has become a serious problem globally. Introducing climate caused asylum, climate migrations, by 2050, 250, uh, by, by 2050, uh, 250 million people will have to migrate because of climate reasons, considering the current situation. I apologize, there was an issue with the audio. These people are going to have to leave their homes because they won't be able to gain access to food or clean water, which is why they will have to migrate. This is climate caused immigration. We will see mass deaths due to excessive heat in summer. In the past, we didn't have this, but this is something that we have already started to witness. So since this is the current picture, we should remember the fact that profit focused policies that aim to protect capital in countries is the main cause where it would be easier to solve the problem if this approach would be abandoned. As you know, capitalistic states for a while have had discussions about the climate crisis. In 2016, the Paris Convention on Climate uh, was placed in front of states. Turkey became party to this agreement with a delay of five years last October when it passed the parliament and finally was enacted in uh, November. Is this not a positive development? I wonder if the current has built any policies around this. I would like to discuss these with you as well. As a matter of fact, the current governing party having approved the climate convention might seem like a promising development, but when we look at the details, we will see that energy, infrastructure, construction related projects show that this is a, a hypocrisy actually in terms of the policy that it is. There are unlicensed constructions that are being used. We have still a pursuit of nuclear uh, energy and also we have licensing for mining facilities which is also illegitimate uh, the local people that are fighting or resisting against these are bringing up lawsuits which are unfortunately uh, not being handled properly by the justice system which is not working in turkey and uh, they have been continuing for many many years these uh, law cases There is a huge destruction project, the Channel Istanbul project, and the persistence to build this all has to do with giving assets away to large groups of capital. The greatest degrees of greenhouse gases are being released by a, a list of companies that were announced recently, and we have we, we, we don't want to mention uh, the highway companies that are also doing the same, but they are uh, benefiting from a lot of uh, profits in Turkey. If you look at the policies between Jan January to November 2011, uh, 2012, 
where does Turkey generate its energy from? Well, I'll share with you the numbers. 31% of our electrical power comes from coal, 32.9% from natural gas, 17.2% from hydroelectrical power, which means the total of the total energy production of Turkey, 64% is generated using fossil fuels still, not renewable energy. Renewable energy only produces 18.9% of our energy, which is thanks to the development in the most recent times as a result of uh, the intense uh, pressure. Again, in Turkey, we're talking about uh, just transitioning. Countries set goals uh, that Turkey became, you know, regarding the Paris Convention on Climate, which Turkey became a party to. The idea is to abandon fossil fuels and to share with the public the relevant goals. What is the status in Turkey? You might ask, in Turkey, actively at the moment, there are 55 thermal plants generating energy, and there is an equal number of thermal plants that are still at a project level. 111 million tons of greenhouse gases are being released by these plants. In Turkey, on an average basis, Turkey is creating 500 million tons of greenhouse gases per annum, which is 64% based on fossil fuels and technological uh, equipment and policy that is based on fossil fuels. Uh, and in Turkey, there are many electrical generation plants that work on natural gas and 25 million tons uh, of greenhouse gases come from these. In addition to the energy plants, the fossil fuels are being used most in transportation. If we look at the transportation system in Turkey, we will see that the, the transportation policy, I correct, um, is based on uh, not a structure where regulation would need, need to be made based on uh, the requirements of railways, etc., but on the build, operate, transfer projects that the current government is so fond of, the hi uh, highway transportation instead of railways. I'll share with you incredible numbers and figures. This is petroleum-based as an approach, and uh, the, the, because of these policies, we are releasing 82 million tons of carbon dioxide per year just because of this focus on highways versus railways, and more than 90% of this comes from uh, the highways. So when we have fossil fuel consumption in the heart of everything, is it possible for this government to create a solution for the climate crisis. Only thermal plants are being appropriated millions of dollars from the public budget. These are gar with guarantees and incentives. And again, in the public, we want to make some, we, we, we should make some regulations. Unfortunately, we have incentives whereby the process is uh, left pending and there are loopholes that are being abused by companies when law is not operating smoothly. Not only in energy policies, but also in terms of tourism investments, uh, mining companies, construction companies, etc. We see that all these operations are all led by the government in ways that is going to make the uh, that are going to make the climate crisis even a bigger problem when uh, there were discussions about the paris convention the countries also made statements about deforestation and also and the protection of uh, the the the um, uh, maintenance of the status regarding agricultural land. Only in summer 2021, uh, we could see how the government failed to manage uh, the wildfires that burned thousands of hectares. None of these were 
uh, coincidental, of course, some of them were due to the destruction to the nature. Some of them were uh, the results of climate crisis and some were because of the approach of the current government, of course. How many hectares of forests were destroyed and how many of them are now being used for purposes that are outside their original uh, use? Unfortunately, 748 uh, thousand hectares of land are now being used for non uh, forestry related purposes at the moment. I'd like to share with you the fact that in October, in the parliament, the Paris Convention on the Climate was adopted, and 40 days later, at the beginning of November, it was in force. Only in a few days after the adoption of the agreement, in the forestry uh, law, NKP made a new uh, amendment. On one hand, they were stating that they were going to fight deforestation as a result of the agreements that they signed. And on the other hand, they made a regulation in the forestry law uh, saying that to protect public interest, they could build like uh, prisons in forests or start mining facilities or start serving uh, tourism purposes by establishing new facilities there. They make this regulation, which also foresees that they could build energy production facilities on the roofs of these facilities. This is hypocrisy, unfortunately. The net zero goal could only be reached by abandoning such hypocrisy in the policies that are not serving the public interests. Against the disruptive nature of the climate crisis, we need to understand the reality of the current status and modernize the current law on forestry and the relevant policies so that they serve the, perp the, the uh, interests of the public. Also, abandoning coal is an area where Turkey has still not announced any goals. No information has been shared about this. Uh, there is a commitment that there will be zero emissions by 2050, but there's no planning. There should be some concrete steps and goals if we are to be sincere. Again, fossil fuels and nuclear energy incentives need to be stopped, and we need to have a 100% renewable energy transitioning process. Uh, we need to, the regulations to take place in this direction. In 2050, forest-related calamities and floods were suffered in 2021. There was the musilage uh, in the Marmara Sea, which was a terrible scene. All of these are clear indicators of how we are directly facing the climate crisis and we need to come up with urgent solutions. Unfortunately, over the past few days, as a result of a snowfall, we have had some problems that we need to highlight as well. This is a result of uh, the killing of 15,000 trees for the building of the Northern Marmara uh, Highway, which was closed for thousands for, for hours because of uh, snowfall. The biggest ecological crime was committed despite the resistance of all NGOs and environmentalist organizations and scientific community. The building of the third airport, it collapsed, it collapsed last, uh, yesterday. Uh, many people were left out uh, in the snow because of this problem. Would you please wrap up? 
Yes, I will try. One last thing to share. Uh, well, as we say, the inequality is becoming more profound. The same applies to gender equity, inequity, as it is the case in wars, climate crisis related issues like immigration, etc., are causing more problems for women and girls. They're being subject and vulnerable to uh, rape, harassment, and other crimes. Thousands of girls have been forced been, uh, have been forced to uh, get married because of uh, migration that is caused by the climate change. And also uh, women are suffering from uh, being victims to uh, crimes such as uh, sex labor by 30% more. We want the removal of this inequity in every possible way. Uh, and we need to fight patriarchy and capitalism uh, fighting together. And we need to enhance this process to uh, make sure that the future is more green and more full of hope. And we can coexist in such a world in the future. Thank you very much for uh, the time allocated. I apologize for uh, exceeding the time uh, allocated to me. Thank you very much. <laughs> Now we will listen to short presentations from Climate Action Network, the International Trade Union Confederation, and European Trade Union Confederation. This session will have presentations delivered in English. Therefore, if you want to benefit from interpretation, please click on the globe icon at the bottom of the screen and choose Turkish. Now I'd like to give the floor to Özlem Katasöz, Climate and Energy Policies Coordinator for Turkey and the Climate Action Network Europe. Well, thank you very much. Um, I also would like to start by thanking the trade union representatives. It was great to hear their perspective on this topic. And as, as I understand from the uh, comment section uh, in the chat box, everyone uh, shared those, shared, shares those perspectives. So let me briefly talk about Climate Action Network. It's a coalition of trade uh, NGOs from 40 uh, countries, more than 150 NGOs. We worked on different aspects of climate change. You can think of us as a network of experts, actually. We are going to listen to important speakers and valuable thoughts. Uh, my presentation will just be an introductory presentation, actually. And as stated by the previous speakers, we are facing extreme weather events and extreme uh, climate conditions all around the world. Last year, uh, last summer, actually, we had wildfires and floods in Turkey and in Europe and also elsewhere in the world. The numbers are quite striking. In the last 40 years, we had uh, seven major uh, weather events, extreme weather events per year. But in the last five years, uh, the number went up to 16. And uh, these are happening only after a 1.2 uh, Celsius degrees temperature incre uh, increase compared to the uh, pre-industrial levels. And the extremity of these weather events will continue and will get worse uh, with 1.5 or 2 point uh, degrees Celsius increase. So IPCC has a report and according to this report, even between 1.5 and 2 degrees, uh, the difference is immense and the change will uh, significantly impact the ecosystems. So with a 2 degree increase compared to 1.5 degree increase, uh, there will be two, maybe three uh, times more uh, species loss and extreme heat waves will be six times stronger, glaciers will uh, meltdown six times 
faster and oceans will be affected uh, three times more. So the difference between 1.5 and 2 will make uh, great differences in our daily lives, actually. So two degrees is the critical threshold. If we let global temperatures increase by two degrees, uh, we can forget about uh, welfare, we can forget about having access to food and clean water and even shelter. In fact, as stated by the previous speakers, not all segments of the society will have the same experience based on their economic conditions, gender, existence of social protection, etc. All of these factors will change the exposure of people to the effects of or impacts of climate change. So this is a new order. This is clear, both economically, socially and ecologically, this is a new order. And in this new order, we have two important jobs to do. The first one is to make sure that global temperature increase is kept at 1.5 or 2 degrees Celsius. We, try to, we should try to cut down emissions. And secondly, we have to uh, build resilient economies and resilient cities. Of course, they all come with a cost. The previous speakers asked who's going to pay for these costs. But of course, there will definitely be costs. And on the other hand, there are costs of not doing anything as well or not getting into action. The insurance costs of natural uh, disasters uh, surpassed 100 billion US dollars now in the last six years. And if we do not stop climate change. The costs related to climate change will constitute 10% of all the uh, revenues and income of the European Union. And again, if we do not stop uh, global warming, Turkey will uh, be losing 8% of its economy by 200, uh, 2100. So these calculations are made based on certain scientific indicators like heat waves, droughts, loss of uh, forest areas because of wildfires or the losses because of uh, the increase in uh, water levels. So these will all affect national incomes and national economies as well. So there's going to be a cost for transition, but the cost for uh, inaction is even higher. We need to change policies to cut down emissions. We need to change our economies. This is clear. And this is not something uh, technical only. It has social uh, and cultural dimensions as well. I'm sure the speakers who are going to speak after me are going to talk about those social impacts. But I think Uh, abandoning a fossil fuel based economy for climate change will bring about a good opportunity for a transition actually for cleaner economies. Let's have a look at the coal industry. Coal is the biggest contributor to uh, carbon emissions and for Turkey for instance phasing out coal will provide a great opportunity for Turkey to deliver its uh, NDC. And when we look at the employment levels in the coal industry in the past 20 years, uh, rate of organization is falling down, the number of uh, fatalities and injuries is increasing, there's no gender balance in the coal industry in terms of employment. So. In Turkey, we have a net zero emission target for 2053. So if we want to reach that target, we have to focus on these industries, fix their structural problems, and uh, 
we can create a new process whereby we can provide uh, decent jobs for more people. So I think we have to focus on uh, the benefits of this transition rather than its costs, because the benefits that will uh, come about will uh, be rolled out to larger masses in the community, actually. This should be our priority. This should be what we should discuss, because we are in the eve of a digital transformation and physical transformation. So, so our job is to make way for new jobs and more decent jobs. I think we should talk about how we can change in a just manner rather than discussing why we shouldn't change. Of course, there will be costs, but we can find ways to bear those costs. There may be simple uh, calculations, actually. The emitters or the polluters can bear those costs. So I think uh, this is uh, what's ahead of us. Again, uh, the cost of inaction is much higher than the cost of doing something I believe that it's high time we listen to the experts. That's why I'd like to conclude my remarks and give the floor back to Jansu. Well, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Özlem. It was great to hear you. Now I'd like to give the floor to Bert Jovell, the Climate Policy Officer of the International Trade Union Confederation. So Bert will be speaking English. If you want to listen to his uh, delivery in Turkish, you can go to the Turkish channel and benefit from interpretation. Thank you very much, uh, Elif, uh, for this opportunity. Thank you for the organizers to invite us. I'm happy to share uh, the position of the International Trade Union Confederation on this important uh, issue. Um, basically, I, I, I like the question that was posed to me, uh, just transition, where does it come from and what does it mean? Uh, the first part of the question is easy. It comes from the trade unions, so that's solved already. Um, and what does it mean? I think that um, my colleagues from the different uh, Turkish trade union confederation at the start already gave a, a very good overview of the different aspects of just transition and what they would mean uh, uh, in, in, in the Turkish reality. So my, my job here, my presentation, I, I will share my, my screen, um, is mainly intended to give the international policy links to the, the, the, the concept of uh, just transition. I, I will try to scare, share my screen and see uh, whether it uh, works. One second. Okay, I think this is better. Um, the first part of um, our just transition approach, and this connects with um, many of the messages that we heard before, um, is the recognition that trade union people are not scientists. Not all of them are climate scientists and that, that uh, control uh, have um, an overview of the climate science. So it's very important for us to trust and to, be, to base our work on international recognized science policies and science reports. So we, we really start our work on just transition based on the reports of the IPCC, the International Panel on Climate Change. And um, recently they did uh, another an important uh, report that give, gave an update of the science base of um, our climate, of climate change. And it um, indicated once again, what we all know, uh, climate change is here, uh, it's uh, affecting us now, and it's affecting us uh, always in a, in a stronger way, but we have an opportunity um, to minimize the impacts if uh, we, we go in the, in the direction of these recognized objectives of reducing emissions with 50% uh, by 2030 and going to net zero by 2050. Um, these are, of course, major transitions and we heard that they will have a huge impact on uh, the, the economies and social life 
in many countries. So that's what we uh, want to translate uh, from the International Trade Union Confederation to our members. Uh, what is what this means? This climate emergency uh, what, where we, that we are faced with. One of the important uh, figures that we always would like to share is this global poll that we did a few years ago, where workers around the world, uh, four out of five workers around the world, want to know what their companies are planning or doing uh, to to respond to the climate uh, climate emergency that we are facing. So we our workers are aware that the climate change is there. Uh, we see the impacts. And uh, now we want to have a voice at the table uh, in the discussions on uh, climate policies. But first, um, and this has always also been uh, indicated um, by most of the speakers, in fact, climate change is not a technological or innovation issue. These things are important, but at the heart, climate change, it's a distribution issue. Um, I heard um, the... the, the Previous speaker. Uh, very sorry to disturb. Are you changing the slides because we are at the first slide still? You're still at the first slide? Yes. Ah, that's strange <laughs> because I was oh, changing them. Okay. Sorry uh, to interrupt. Um, and is it changing now? Yes, it's changing now. Okay. Um, I have too many screens. So what I was saying is that, um, yes, it's, it's a, a focus of the discussion on costs um, can be uh, complicated to mobilize um, uh, the, the action that is needed, but we have to be realistic on who, who is benefiting from uh, climate policies and who is in fact um, bearing all the costs and who is responsible for climate policies. And that's why, uh, we always insist on, on the class perspective, on the north-south divide between uh, the climate policies, uh, the climate impact. And this is an important research done by Oxfam, where you can clearly see that the richest 10% in the world are responsible for um, more than 50% of the climate emissions, while the poorest uh, 50% uh, only are responsible for 7% of the emissions. This clearly indicates the responsibilities around the world. We also see this um, uh, with the consumers in Europe uh, at the individual level, not only between countries. Um, you see that, for example, the, the richest 1% in Europe have a very much higher impact uh, on the climate than the bottom 50% uh, in our societies. And we also see that over the years, the rich people are polluting more and more while uh, the, the, less, the, the bottom 50% of society um, in economic terms are um, reducing uh, their impact. So this social dimension of climate change is an important um, aspect that we uh, need to take with us right from the start. The trade unions since many years um, have been mobilizing around this uh, issue and we, we did it with the slogan, there are no jobs on a dead planet. Um, this was important to, to bring uh, all our affiliates, all our members around the world um, uh, up to speed on, on the climate challenges. But it's also important uh, to deal with the politicians that often speak about uh, climate change as an opportunity there will be jobs, jobs, jobs created with climate change. But from the trade union uh, side, we are, of course, very um, enthusiastic about these opportunities that will be created. But um, in the end, what's important is which kind of jobs will be created. Will this be quality jobs? Will it be decent work? If not, um, um, it will not uh, bring us any farther. Only social just solutions can have uh, a, a lasting impact and have uh, bring the changes that we need. So that's why we came up with the concept of just transition. Um, it's about the livelihoods of the workers and their communities in the transition to low carbon. So it's the impact of climate change on workers and the impact of climate policies on workers and how uh, they are dealt with 
uh, in, in finding the solutions. It's important that it's based on social dialogue between workers and their unions, employers and governments. Um, social dialogue is uh, the crucial aspect of uh, just transition policies. Um, if it's about the workers and their communities, you need to speak with the, these workers and, uh, and the communities. Just transition should not be empty concepts. It should be based on plans, um, plans and guarantees for better and decent jobs, including social pro protection measures, training opportunities that bring more security uh, for the workers. For the unions, um, we, we, we see this just transition as part of our more broader agenda and view and our proposals uh, on the functioning of our economies, where we uh, need, uh, where we are asking for and campaigning for a new social contract. This new social contract starts with um, um, this um, realization, the fact that we need um, jobs to be created and these jobs should be climate friendly jobs but we also need uh, good jobs, good quality jobs in education, care, uh, all types of uh, quality public services. The second part of this new social contract is um, the concept of the protection of labor rights. Um, men, often in these discussions on climate change, there is an important um, attention to human rights, but um, often campaigners uh, tend to forget that labor rights are human rights. They are decided in the ILO, in the International Labor Organization. They include um, uh, aspects on uh, labor protection, wages, uh, working hours, health and safety at work, uh, the right to organize, and uh, the rights to collective bargaining. So without protection of these rights, uh, we cannot have serious climate or any other uh, uh, policies. Social protection, provision of social protection is of course a fundamental aspect and it's also important in the climate uh, uh, debate. Um, if we, and then the fourth and fifth aspect is about equality and inclusion. Um, we cannot accept any discrimination due to income, race or gender and we want uh, nobody left behind in uh, our economic uh, uh, model. Everybody should um, have the benefits of our economy. So these are the, the, is the broader concept in which we see just transition as one of the pillars for a new uh, social contract. Just transition, as I indicated already before, has uh, several aspects. Um, the assessment jointly trade unions, employers, governments, social movements of the social and economic aspects of the, the climate uh, uh, crisis. The prom promotion of public investments, this is crucial. Governments should be at the steering wheel. Governments have to drive the transition. We cannot lead it to the private sector alone. Uh, skills and, and retraining are important. Social protection and social dialogue. For the environment movement, this aspect of social dialogue often is, is, is complicated. Um, and we, we notice that the environmental movement not always understands very well why trade unions insist so much on social dialogue and why sometimes the social dialogue uh, happens with environmental organizations and sometimes without environmental organization. And this is important to, to stress that if we discuss, uh, if I personally discuss with my boss on my, my contract, my, my my working contract, I discuss directly with my boss about my wage and the working conditions. Uh, I don't need Greenpeace besides me to discuss with my boss about my wage. Um, next, unions um, do collective bargaining. We, we organize in group about these uh, working conditions, wages, uh, minimum wages, social protection aspects directly related to our uh, labor contracts. This we do employers, unions. If we look um, broader, if we look to the transition to a low carbon economy, then of course, um, social movement, other stakeholders uh, become very important and we have to include them um, completely 100% in the discussions on this transition. And there, um, the, the 
these actors become also uh, very important. But straight from the start, uh, just transition policies, you need to discuss them with the unions or we don't see um, any, we, we, don't, we cannot call it uh, just transition policies. Of course, we all know that these policies and these, uh, the conditions are different in, in many different countries. That's why we often uh, tell stories, we bring together, we collect stories uh, from, from everywhere in the world on how the realities are in Costa Rica, in Kenya, uh, in Serbia, in New Zealand, uh, on, on these just transition stories and we learn from each other. And often we do this uh, together with the environmental movements in uh, these uh, countries. I would like to, to, to end with uh, um, two references to the international context. Um, the Paris Agreement, of course, is the, the first in, important hook and the, in fact, the most important hook for us to, to speak about uh, just transition. In the Paris Agreement, all the countries uh, committed to the imperative of a just transition of the workforce and the creation of decent work and quality jobs. So. The Paris Agreement very strongly and very clearly makes the link between just transition and the, the role of the workforce, jobs, uh, and, and the fact that we need quality jobs. So it's not about any talk about leaving no one behind or social movements. No, it's about decent work and quality jobs. And you discuss this with the organizations that are involved about this. Um, to avoid um, discussions, complicated discussions about um, what does it all mean, this just transition. Um, governments, employers, um, trade unions have done um, discussions in the United Nations body that specifically uh, created to deal with these issues of labor issues. And, and that's where we um, also in 2015 um, negotiated the guidelines for a just transition. Uh, where you can have some kind of menu of all the different aspects of just transition on how to implement them. Uh, this is um, sometimes it, yeah, it's a very uh, comprehensive overview, which can be um, have the impression that it's quite complex, but at the same time, uh, the conditions in all countries are different. So we need guidelines that can accommodate uh, for all the conditions in all the countries. If I now look qu quickly to how governments are implementing these commitments that they made uh, at the, in the Paris Agreement, um, they committed to just transition in the Paris Agreement. Uh, this means that in their national climate plans, they should, there should be reference to uh, just transition. Sadly, um, it does not, um, this is not the case, only a limited number of countries uh, mention the words just transition in their in their uh, NDCs. Um, the, trade, the European Union, of course, has a, a whole policy framework on, on just transition. So this is already 27 countries. Um, and, and even the EU can do better in terms of uh, how they implement just transition policies. But uh, Ludovic, after me, will go more in, deep, in detail on that. Um, other countries like uh, Chile or Colombia or uh, Costa Rica are countries that mention just transition but never speak with the unions. So for us, this cannot be just transition. These are not serious policies uh, on, on just transition. I don't know how many time I have left. Uh, I think you can just uh, sum up. Okay. Thank you. Um, so in order to um, to be to be effective um, in the implementation of these just transition policies, um, it, it has to, of course, come from both sides. Um, for example, at um, the climate summit in Glasgow, uh, the end of last year, we saw that in different parts of the agreement, um, the Glasgow climate agreement, there were many references to just transition, even in the important paragraph on uh, stopping uh, with coal and, and with fossil fuels, there was a direct reference to just transition. So we see there is a lot of, of opportunities on uh, just transition. Uh, countries are picking it up and now the trade unions should be ready to, to engage with governments uh, together with environmental organization and social movements to implement these policies. 
And this, uh, of course, um, involves responsibilities from both sides, from governments, but also from trade unions in terms of capacity building, building working with uh, the members. And uh, I just wanted to share this um, uh, a picture of a campaign that we did the last years. It's called Climate and Employment Proof Our Work, where we work with our affiliates on the ground uh, in companies, in organizations, to set up these uh, discussions on climate policies uh, at a company level, at organizational level. Um, this work, in con very concrete in companies, uh, is the basis later then for our advocacy work towards governments and our advocacy work uh, at um, the UN level. Um, this is a uh, picture of um, last year. This year we will do this campaign on 22nd of June. And um, we have already done this often in collaboration with, with um, civil society and environmental organizations. Greenpeace has been uh, supporting us. Um, and also um, Friends of the Earth and, and other uh, environmental organizations. And we are very happy uh, and, and insist very much on also at the, at the local level, at the ground level uh, of, the, of, of these uh, collaborations uh, between uh, civil society organizations and uh, the, the union movement. So this was my general overview of the hooks that we see at the international level um, where our affiliates on the ground in Turkey, for example, uh, are picking up this work and where we see that we can work together because we think that just transition is the clue and social just policies will be the only way to realize the ambitions, the climate ambitions that we all think are necessary. If it's not just, it will just not happen. And uh, just for the workers means implementing just transitions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bert, for the presentation. And thank you for being with us today here. Uh, maybe we get back to you with the questions in the end. Şimdi sözü Avrupalar Sendikalar Konfederasyonu Konfederasyon. We would like to leave the floor to Ludovic Void from Etrip. Floor is yours, sir. Yes, thank you. Hello to everyone. Can you hear me well? I have a unstable connection, so I hope it's okay. Yes, we do hear you well. Uh, okay, very good. Thank you. Uh, so, um, yeah, happy to be with you. Uh, so really also uh, first, uh, I want to thank uh, um, our partners in this uh, in organizing uh, this uh, uh, this webinar, uh, Can Europe, for the proposal um, of doing this. Uh, also, our Turkish uh, trade unions for the uh, the availability and uh, willingness to enter in these discussions, and uh, and also the high attendance of today show uh, that it's an important topic uh, for you. And we hope it will help really to uh, to steer uh, uh, our uh, our proposals uh, on just transition. Uh, uh, at your level, at Turkish level, so that it can bring uh, a future uh, that uh, leaves no one no one behind. So, from the European uh, trade union perspective, for sure, I cannot. Uh, it has already been said, but we have to say it again and again. Uh, it's important to state the obvious: climate change is here and now. Uh, the last years uh, have shown uh, have been the warmest on record, uh, and we see uh, in the news that these increase uh, in temperatures uh, are accompanied by floods, by storms, by drought, by wildfires. We know that these events are getting more intense and more frequent over time, and they put at risk the lives, the jobs, and wealth uh, of many European workers and their families especially in already vulnerable regions and communities. For that reason, we all have a responsibility to act, it has been said, and as the European Trade Union Confederation, we support ambitious climate action and the objective of the Paris Agreement. At the EU level, this means also that uh, ETUC supports the climate targets proposed in the European Green Deal, so meaning uh, minus 55% greenhouse gas emission uh, by 2030 and a climate neutrality by 2050. For us, the statu quo is no solution in this debate and we need a transition before it's too late. It is a matter of solidarity with most vulnerable communities and with the future generations. The question is therefore whether, uh, not whether we will uh, achieve climate neutrality by 2050, but rather how do we move toward this, uh, this goal? 
And for this, just transition is key. This is the only answer uh, that we have uh, as uh, trade unions. The transition must be just in terms of output, but also in terms uh, of process. In other words, the transition uh, must not only reduce inequalities, uh, and it is important that uh, uh, in the welcoming uh, speeches, this uh, element of inequalities was uh, brought as an important one. It is a key question of uh, just transition, um, but not only reduce inequalities, but also improve the well-being of workers uh, and also involve them in the process through social dialogue and collective bargain. If the transition to a climate neutral and circular economy will bring uh, new opportunities across European uh, countries, it will also bring a lot of new uh, challenges that we will have to fix. We identify six main ones that we will have to overcome collectively. The first one is that the new jobs uh, that will be created in the green industries will not automatically coincide geographically with jobs that will be lost uh, in other sectors. This means that some regions will benefit a lot from the green transition with new jobs and new opportunities, while some others will suffer from negative impacts and require a lot of support and solidarity. For those regions, it is essential that our governments and public authorities provide adequate financial support, solidarity between regions, as well as sound industrial uh, policies. Because it's not enough to have a climate uh, to have a climate policy if we lose uh, these jobs uh, in Europe. When designing these industrial policies, it is important not to oppose green industries versus brown industries. Indeed, in order to build offshore windmills, solar panels, uh, or to renovate buildings uh, that will be needed for the tr uh, climate transition, we will also need a lot of steel, of aluminium, and cement, which at the moment uh, are produced by industries that are highly in uh, energy intensive. To make sure that these industries and their workers have a future, we need to invest massively in innovation and in the development of low carbon technologies like hydrogen, uh, renewables, batteries, etc. And also and foremost in just transition plants. The second challenge is that the new jobs created in the transition will not automatically coincide with the current skills of the workforce. Indeed, you cannot ask a coal miner to turn from one day to another into a construction worker or a wide mile, uh, wind mile uh, technician. Similarly, uh, we know that the shift from combustion engine vehicles to electric vehicles will entail massive changes in terms of skills needs and content of jobs. We therefore need to provide training programs and new opportunities to those workers, and they need adequate social protection during the transition period. Take the example, uh, yeah, the third challenge I would uh, want to bring is that it is not yet guaranteed that working conditions in green jobs that will be created will be as good as those in highly unionized sectors that are for the moment also at risk of, the, uh, of uh, being uh, where jobs can be uh, destroyed. So this element of working conditions of wages is an important one because in traditional sectors, we have been able as unions to get uh, good working conditions. For that reason, we need to ensure that the creation of quality jobs is at the core of any transition plan. We should insist that new jobs created offer decent jobs, decent working conditions, and allow also trade union representation. This is not always the case in all the sectors uh, that uh, promise to uh, create green jobs. The fourth challenge, climate policies such as carbon taxes, for example, can have strong regressive distributional effects. Uh, if nothing is done to mitigate these effects, this will mean that the climate transition will affect proportionally more the low income households and that it would increase inequalities. It could also increase energy poverty, mobility poverty. Uh, so to be socially acceptable, the climate policy should therefore ensure a fair redistribution, put the question of inequalities at the center. Uh, so progressive taxation, protecting low income households uh, is key there so that no one uh, is uh, left behind. For that, we need fair taxation systems. This is key uh, to finance the transition also. We need to ask policymakers to develop legislation also to guarantee so, uh, strong social protections, uh, strong uh, minimum wages, equal opportunity, also uh, support for housing, assistance for homeless, etc. So a lot has, been, has to be done on the social uh, issues because we cannot only have climate uh, policies that are hard laws 
we need also the social uh, to mitigate the social impact the labor impact uh, with uh, more than recommendations we need also hard law uh, for the social um, uh, consequence meaning uh, just transition needs also to have a framework uh, and a legislation to ensure that uh, climate policies do not uh, affect uh, people fifth challenge uh, beside the mitigation measures uh, there we know also that climate uh, change consequence will affect citizens and workers in a man, in many ways so the rising temperature will increase the health and safety risk for outdoor workers such as in construction and agriculture and i think that it's particularly an important topic also for uh, turkey extreme weather event will increase the stress on our public services healthcare and social protection systems for example firefighters and civil protection uh, workers see their workload increase with more frequent and more uh, intense floods or forest fires in parallel we see that hospital and health workers will have to deal with more pressure during heat waves these are only examples of the consequence of climate change where we need also adaptation measures and protection for uh, these uh, these workers all this in a uh, in a context of underinvestment in public services by public authorities so social protection systems would be crucial to increase uh, the resilience uh, of our societies and protect the most vulnerable during extreme weather events and co uh, COVID crisis has also in illustrated this. The last challenge may actually come also from ourselves. So uh, every transition process brings the share, uh, the share of fear and uncertainty. So it means also that in these conditions, also for trade unions, it can be tempting to advocate for the statu quo in order to avoid or postpone difficult decisions. Because we know that it might be worker that will be affected by uh, climate policies, uh, but as it was said, the cost of inaction is even uh, worse uh, for, uh, for us, uh, for our workers and our uh, communities. So it is important that uh, here we also convince uh, our workers to engage in this, uh, uh, in this transition, not to adopt a passive attitude uh, or opposing, uh, but really imposing our just transition strategies in the climate uh, debate. Uh, so, uh, if we do not do that, we also risk that some of our people uh, may deny uh, the reality of climate change and also may offer their vote uh, to uh, populist, uh, the populist uh, parties that will uh, tell them that this uh, transition will have no cost. Only just transition can uh, can really deal uh, with uh, with this, uh, these elements. So. Of course, uh, this can not be uh, done at all costs. It's not because we say that uh, we have to engage in climate policies um, and in net zero emission that governments have a blank sign on uh, everything. It must be done uh, through a social and just transition. Trade unions need to get involved and negotiate transition plans that will support workers while moving towards uh, carbon neutrality. And for that, I think it's important to uh, to show that, uh, yeah, it was uh, been said by uh, um, uh, by Bert uh, a lot. Uh, it cannot be done without uh, uh, without unions. But uh, I would like to bring also a few uh, concrete examples uh, from uh, at EU level uh, from uh, the the engagement of unions in just transition policies and what it can look like. If we take the example of coal, which uh, is, I guess, relevant also in the Turkish debate, as uh, we understand that uh, coal generates over a third of tur uh, Turkey electricity and emits a third of uh, Turkey greenhouse uh, gas. Uh, when it comes to the EU, the coal accounts for around 15% of EU uh, greenhouse gas emission and represents around uh, 300,000 direct and indirect jobs. Those activities are, of course, highly concentrated in a few regions. Uh, the challenge is, therefore, to phase out coal as soon as possible while providing a future for the workers in those regions. So if there's a phase out of coal, there's, there's a need to have a phase in of jobs in the regions uh, in order to show to people that uh, the, the only uh, that the perspective is not that they have to move from their region uh, to another one. In this regard, the example of Spain and Germany, only to uh, cite two uh, of them, are interesting as they show how policy, uh, policymakers can tackle the issue through social dialogue. In Germany, a special uh, commission in 2018 was created 
uh, to uh, gather public authorities, local governments, social partners, academic and civil society to agree on the modality of the phase out. The commission, uh, this commission recommended a phase out of coal by 2038, as well as 40 billion euro investment plan. Uh, social protection, training program, measures to create decent jobs were part of this package. Uh, and so even if the date of the phase out uh, will be updated also due to the new, uh, the new uh, development in Germany and with the new uh, government uh, in Germany, this shows that it is a good example that uh, a, a climate objective has to be transposed in concrete measures uh, with um, uh, social dialogue and uh, collective bargaining. Spain is the second example. Following massive mobilization from trade unions and workers, the government and social partners start, uh, started working on an agreement to ensure just transition. This led to the, how we call it, it's the Plan del Carbon, so the carbon plan, uh, which foresee a closure of mines in Spain. Uh, also in 2017-2018, this uh, happened. And it forced so uh, early retirement schemes, redundancy payment, reskilling schemes, and investment in those mining regions. Of course, we have to show if it worked. Uh, uh, we have to, uh, to look at uh, if it worked or not, but it means that from a policy point of view, uh, this was also done uh, with workers' involvement. We'll finish uh, with at EU level, things are, uh, have all also been moving over the uh, last few years. So after repeated call also from the trade union uh, confederation, um, it, uh, the EU uh, uh, created a just transition fund. Uh, the fund amounts to seven, uh, more than 17 billion euro and aims at supporting the economic diversification of regions most affected by clim the climate transition. So uh, coal, lignite, wholesale, peat and energy intensive industries. The fund is also aiming at creating more solidarity uh, between EU member states as poorer countries will receive proportionally more of the funding. In order to benefit uh, from the fund, countries also have to develop just transition territorial plans with the involvement of social partners. This is not always done, but this is what is recommended uh, and asked from the member states. So we have also here a tool uh, and, uh, to, uh, at our disposal to uh, force our uh, governments in the EU, and we hope it can help also in, uh, in the discussion in Turkey, if it can be inspirational. Uh, this, uh, this, uh, this can help. Of course, this just transition fund is not enough in terms of scope. It should uh, the scope should be extended to uh, other sectors. The amount uh, on it uh, in it uh, is really not enough uh, to cover uh, the, the the challenge of the transition. But we have at our disposal a first uh, tool. Um, so to conclude, it is clear uh, that the way forward to achieving climate neutrality is through green and social uh, policies and interconnected uh, climate and uh, just transition policies. And we will, as trade unions, of course, fight for that. The Gilets jaunes uh, crisis in France has taught us also that the climate transition is not only about technologies and market forces. It is first and foremost about people and fairness, about workers, about their communities. A successful Green Deal uh, can only be a program that creates decent jobs, ensure better working conditions, and enhance workers' participation and trade union uh, representatives' uh, work in this transition. This will only be achieved through solidarity, sound industrial policy, fair redistribution, and the setting of minimum uh, social standards, so, such as the uh, minimum wage, social protection, uh, uh, increase of collective bargaining. At all stages of this process, social dialogue and involvement of workers will be key. We hope this will also help you uh, at Turkish level that all this development in the, the European uh, sphere uh, can also uh, push uh, this discussion at Turkish level. And really, uh, uh, we hope that we will be able to discuss uh, this further with you and develop a just transition strategies together. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ludovic. Thanks to all our presenters from ITUK, ETUK, and Kenro. E, teşekkür ederiz tüm konuşmacılarımıza. Şimdi e, sendikaların, Türkiye Sendika Konfederasyonları'nın adil iş perspektifini tartışması için e, Bengisu'ya vereceğim. Now I'd like to give the floor to Bengisu Özenç from Sustainable Economics and Finance Association. She is the director and she's going to moderate this session on just transition in Turkey. We will listen to Turkey 
Turkish trade union's perspectives on just transition. Again, uh, our speakers will be talking in, in Turkish, so if you want to benefit from interpretation, please go to the English channel. Aljan, so thank you very much for inviting me to this event as a moderator. I'd like to thank the previous speakers for their uh, enlightening and comprehensive uh, speeches. In fact, when we look at all the discussions, we see that when we talk about just transition, we also mention other injustices around the world in many different fields. Therefore, a just transition can only happen if we take into account the other areas where we have certain uh, failures in providing justice. In Turkey, unfortunately, we lag behind in terms of climate policies. For many years, Turkey tried to protect itself uh, by remaining in uh, the list of developing countries, actually. And I think that was a big obstacle in front of developing strong policies. And it was quite an inactive area for us, actually. So we were aware of this transition, but uh, we were caught by it in an unprepared manner. If Turkey had taken the opportunity earlier to design the transition according to its own conditions, uh, we wouldn't have been in this situation now, but now we have to think of the transition in terms of risks and in terms of threats. And the main topic of the agenda is the uh, European Green Deal and the streamline decarbonization uh, movement. And of course, it affects us in many different fields. So in the midst of all these uncertainties and unpreparedness, we try to uh, get ready for a new agenda as well. Yes, we ratified the Paris Agreement and we declared a very important target for 2053, but we still do not have policies that will take us to uh, that target. And of course, lack of a certain policy, lack of national objectives creates certain uh, uncertainties. In the design process, we have to involve different stakeholders, but since uh, the stakeholders are not involved, then we cannot come up with priorities. These policies should be addressed in a multi-layer manner. They should be addressed very carefully, and we should not uh, waste more time. On the NGO side, of course, we try to uh, develop ourselves. We try to improve ourselves by looking at best practices. We extend our know-how, and we try to generate data and know-how specifically for Turkey to raise awareness and to help development of policies by the relevant authorities. Yes, I think uh, it is obvious that the NGOs have built a certain knowledge in this manner and certain expertise. And in the public sector, new areas are emerging where people talk about just transition. But of course, there is a need for further support to come up with a holistic approach. The data and information generated in these uh, meetings are of critical importance for the authorities to benefit and to design their policies. In this session, we will have a more detailed discussion with the trade union representatives. We will be listening to them and their uh, ideas about uh, just transition and how they uh, evaluate Turkey's approach to just transition. Yes, in the opening uh, remarks, we heard uh, the opinions of the uh, trade unions. We heard certain concepts like leave no one behind. But of course, we want to hear more about their inclusive policies and We should not define transition as building new policies on top of the existing ones. I think in terms of the transition process, we have to redesign the existing policies and uh, remove those which uh, are in conflict with uh, the objectives for 
a better future. I think uh, we don't have much time left. Therefore, I'd like to kindly ask the panelists to limit their uh, speeches to 10 minutes. We'll have a lengthier discussion in the Q&A session. So I'd like to give the floor to Eyüp Özer from Birleşik Metalish International, uh, Birleşik Metalish from DISC, is an international relations expert. Well, thank you very much. I'd like to continue from where my president, Adnan Bey, left. In fact, when we speak of just transition, many people think of different things. It's normal, actually, because uh, every concept is meaningful uh, for different people in a different manner, actually. This is valid for uh, just transition. It is valid for climate neutral as well. So our definition of climate neutrality may be different than the definition developed by industries. For us, just transition may mean a transition to electric vehicles, for instance, and leaving uh, internal combustion engines. But for building electric vehicles, there's going to be further production by using different materials, actually. But there will still be production, and there will, be still, be, there will still be consumption. Not much will change, actually. There will be new uh, technologies like green steel, but still, it will be in the hands of the capital. So, especially what the European Union calls the new green order is not new, is not transition, and is not green at all. You said we should not build new policies on top of existing ones. We should redesign the existing policies as well. Yes, I agree with you. In the future that we want to see, we have to uh, topple down those capitalist policies. My president, Adnan, talked about this. There is the capital movement. The raison d'etre is profit maximization, and it is impossible for them to be green. Therefore, a green capitalism is not possible. Of course, if we said green capitalism is not possible and we just uh, sit behind, then we would be comfortable, but we don't have that luxury because uh, we are facing an urgent crisis, which requires urgent and radical solutions. So how are we going to build those radical and urgent solutions? Some of the speakers mentioned this uh, just transition program. Can it be the agenda of the working class? It is exactly why we work on this agenda, actually, because we have the transition program, which uh, is imposed on by the capital. There is also the transition program, uh, which is independently developed by the working class. But of course, uh, the capital uh, agenda is more dominant. We saw this during globalization in the neoliberal policies, actually. So the capital owners imposed their own agenda, and they said, uh, to the workers that you have to add up those policies, otherwise you'll be jobless. Therefore, the trade unions had to follow those policies. But if the working class uh, cannot develop its own independent agenda, then uh, we will still have to stick to the uh, agenda imposed by the uh, capital movement. That's why being independent and having an independent program, transition program by the uh, working class is very important. So what do we mean by that? What I mean is, in fact, uh, we heard an example from the uh, Gilets Jaunes movement. Right at that time, they said, the working class is against this ecological transformation. They are resisting to this ecological transformation because they want to keep their jobs, for instance, miners. And just like in the example of Gilets Jaunes, they want to uh, protect the status quo. And they showed us as scapegoats and they showed us as uh, the main obstacle in front of transformation. No. So the working movement and ecology movement or the trade union movement, they are compatible actually. We have uh, common denominators, we have uh, common interests. But of course, those common interests can only be achieved through a common agenda. You earlier talked about 
the effects of uh, just transition on industries. Let me give an example. Uh, many people talked about incentives. So on the New Year's Eve, I watched this stand-up show by a famous Turkish comedian, Cem Yilmaz. And a very rich TV producer uh, organized a campaign to raise funds for the richest businessmen in Turkey. And he was making fun of this, actually. We did the same thing. We supported employers, actually. We uh, compromised a lot of things. And TÜSİAD, for instance, uh, released a report on the transformation of the automotive industry, calling for new incentives from the government on the car industry, because we're going to transition to EV, electric vehicles. Really? Well, in fact, uh, we are supporting the capital as the people of Turkey. Ford, for instance, uh, made a profit of 5 billion Turkish liras in 2019, and we compromise a lot as workers. So this is a clash between the capital and the working class. The capital makes all that profit, sharing the profit with their shareholders, and giving nothing to the working class. Another example, uh, energy industry. In our country, a couple of weeks ago, died, a, a young boy died because uh, the distribution company uh, cut down their power. Every day on the news, uh, you see discussions or fights between uh, people and the distribution companies because uh, people are not able to pay their bills and the distribution company uh, cut down the power. And after that event, the general director of the distribution company said to the farmers, uh, do not plant any goods because you won't be able to irrigate your fields because we will cut down your power if you do not uh, pay your bills. They threaten the farmers, but energy sector is quite profitable. Energy Sun, for instance, uh, made a profit of 5 billion uh, Turkish liras. Again, Energy Sun, an energy company, is one of the sponsors of the TUSIAD report that I mentioned earlier. And again, in this report, and, and again, Energy Sun uh, calls for further incentives from the government to support the energy industry. So 20 years ago, the energy distribution market was privatized. And back then, everyone said uh, energy distribution will be very efficient if it is privatized. Because in the hands of the state, it's not efficient at all. And if we privatize the energy distribution and transition area, then uh, things will be more efficient and no one uh, will be deprived of their power. But let's have a look at now. Children are dying because of cold, because their electricity is cut. Farmers cannot irrigate their fields. And we are still to make a compromise. If you were to use public money, then why did you get privatized? I think we should re-expropriate the energy distribution sector. Another major industry, the steel industry. We had a meeting a couple of days ago. Yes, there's the uh, carbon border adjustment mechanism. And after this mechanism is implemented, the steel industry will be affected to a great deal. There will be many jobs lost. And I looked at the TUSIAD report to see uh, the losses actually. But well, first of all, even the steel producers in Turkey uh, claim that Turkey produces greener steel than the European Union. It's debatable, of course, but I think it's because of the effects of uh, later industrialization uh, in Turkey. There are less integrated facilities and we have electricity powered uh, furnaces producing steel by consuming less electricity. That's why it's greener, people claim. But Turkey does not compete with the producers in the EU. Turkish steel producers compete with Russia, uh, China, and India, countries with larger emissions than Turkey. In the first nine months of this year, Erdemir's EBITDA is $404 per kilo of coal, for ton of coal, excuse me. So we are trying to uh, reduce the working hours per week 
he tried to bring it down to 37.5 from 45. And many employers will uh, say that, no, this is too much a cost to uh, bear, actually. We won't be able to pay for it. But the cost of reducing working hours will only be $1 per ton of uh, coal, actually. They will be making a profit of $403 rather than 404 But if you ask them, this is the end of the world. So for them, for the capital holders, doing something uh, in the way to lose interest is a disaster. That's why uh, they call just transition is an extreme or extraordinary uh, step. Yes, this is an extraordinary crisis, but the way out of this crisis is not the way to uh, be developed by the capital holders, because if you follow that path, there will be further destruction, there will be further production, further consumption, and the profits will only be used by capital holders again. So this is the summary of the uh, capital's agenda. Of course, we have to come up with an agenda ourselves as well. Eupe, you have a couple of minutes left. Could you please wrap up? Because we want to leave some uh, answer a Q and A time as well. Yes, I speak fast. I didn't want to interfere. No, no, I understand. Okay, let me just wrap up then. So what should be the agenda? Yes, we want to shorten the working hours. Why do we defend shortening of the working hours? Because it's because of the productive economy that we are in such a horrible state. If we are to phase out coal, for instance, or other polluting industries, which we should, by the way, we have to create new uh, jobs, new employment. And the only way, the best way uh, to do so is to shorten working hours radically. So we've been talking about the fact that uh, there's no problem called unemployment in Turkey. Uh, the only problem is long working hours. In 1930s, uh, Keynes capitalism was introduced as a very beneficial uh, system, actually. And they said that there will be too much efficiency and productivity around the world that we will only work for 15 uh, hours a week. It is true, actually. Uh, efficiency has increased, but we don't work for 15 hours a week. So those who uh, generate that efficiency are the polluters, actually. Energy industry, for instance, is very profitable. I think uh, we have to uh, expropriate the energy industry so that uh, the profits are shared uh, by the industry again and uh, people do not die because of uh, cold. Okay, I wanted to touch upon a couple of important issues, coal and transition in coal. We have been hearing this from European trade unions actually and Germany is given as a very good example and there are not many countries in the world to uh, spare some budget, just like Germany, to coal transition or coal phasing out. And technologies are changing, that's true. Yes, new jobs will emerge, new skills will be needed. Those are true. We need vocational education for that. But uh, just providing vocational education will not provide employment. It will just uh, enable the capital holders to have access to a cheaper labor force. So uh, coal phasing out or coal transition in Germany uh, led to job losses in the coal regions in Germany, actually, although they spent a lot of money. Uh, AFD, for instance, uh, became a lot stronger in the coal regions because if you deprive people of their secure jobs and if you force them to work in less precarious jobs, then of course people will divert to extreme right-wing parties. That's why AFD became stronger in Germany. And finally, I'd like to touch upon uh, international injustice. The world is not just, it is true. Every country uh, is different actually. And now that we have such an in unjust world, many countries are lagging behind in terms of development, for instance. European Union introduced the carbon border adjustment mechanism, which will uh, lead to 
country is lagging further behind, actually. It's not like giving an opportunity to uh, the countries in the world which uh, do not pollute, uh, to pollute more, actually. It means that we have to implement a transformation mechanism. Now, for many years, fossil uh, companies have been polluting the world, and I think we need to impose taxes to stop them from further polluting the world. I think we need an international tax policy. Similarly, just like we're talking about new industries, new jobs, and new transformation, I think uh, we also require new raw materials. In the electric vehicles, for instance, we need further cobalt, lithium, and nickel. And we see the repercussions of that in our daily lives. Many developed countries or industrial, industrialized countries uh, are fighting uh, with each other to have access to those uh, raw materials actually in the developing world. In the Boliv Bolivian mines or in Congo, for instance, both Chinese companies or US companies are competing to get hold of those uh, minerals. Before 2003, the industrialist move created its own uh, competition. And I think uh, the same goes for green transformation as well. New areas of competition will arise. So, NATO, for instance, decided to build relations with raw material holders to uh, compete China. So what are we going to do? Are we going to support the capital holders so in order, in order not to lose our jobs? Or are we going to unite to come up with a more fair, a more uh, just policy? In fact, if we pick the first option, if we compromise, the same will happen just like after the Second World War, actually. So workers' movement and uh, environmentalist movement can complement each other. I think the way to do so is to focus on the daily interests of the working class and to relate them with uh, just transition. If we can make that connection, the working class will mobilize around it and they will start fighting capitalism and the capital holders to implement this new transformation to a completely climate neutral life, uh, which is to the benefit of the working class. Because of limited time, I have to speak too fast. Sorry about it. And thank you very much. Well, thank you very much. You gave us a very good perspective in the historical context as well that I had to interfere uh, because I have to manage time. I'm very sorry about it. Secondly, we will be listening to Ahmed Halfaya from Hakish. He is an international relations expert. By the way, if you have any questions, please put them in the chat. Uh, we have exceeded our time limit. So if you have any questions, please ask them on the chat box. I'll give the floor to Ahmed now. As a native Turkish speaker, I would like to make my remarks in English. I'm humbled to be part of this webinar, but uh, before sharing my insights on just the transition, I would like to acknowledge and appreciate the, the brilliant work uh, carried out by post ITC and ETC on this matter, a special thank you to Can Europe, uh, Turkey, the office, uh, in particular, Elif, Jansu, and Uzlam have made every effort to make this webinar possible. So I can hear the English interpretation at the same time. Give me a second, please. I think you are okay. it, uh... Yes, thank you. Oh. Thank you, Ahmed. Oh. Thank you. 
because of time limitation, uh, I will. Uh, I'm obliged to read out uh, to read out what I have noted down. Uh, and I have shared this early morning. My presentation with the interpreter. I hope you got it in order to easily follow up what I'm saying. Uh, from a worker's perspective, uh, the transition will profoundly reshape uh, the labor market in ways that creates both new risks and new opportunities for workers. New jobs, but uh, also in, in some cases, destruction of jobs, uh, replacement of some existing occupations by new ones, along, along with the uh, need for new competencies and skills. Certain sectors and regions, especially the ones that are dependent on carbon intensive industries may be more negatively impacted than others. In a nutshell, the concept of just transition introduce, introduces the fact that, that the need to create jobs and to protect the environment are not in, in conflict. Thus, the concept of just transition triggers demands for supporting and protecting the workers who are at risk of losing their jobs because of the widespread implementation of environment protection policies by labor unions. The process of negotiating strategies and policies for a just transition should take into account the differences in sectors and regions, and regions with the country and the economy. Uh, different levels of regional development, uh, climate-related risks and the demographic structure factors, as well as the conditions that have created them should be evaluated and unique approaches adapted to significant specific situations and conditions should be developed. There is no one solution fits all. In other words, the risks, costs, and opportunities of a just transition vary considerably between regions and communities. Moreover, the effects of transition will defeat both economically between and within sectors and socially between social groups. Therefore, the participation and engagement of all social stakeholders in the just transition process is extremely significant. It is better for each region to create roadmaps for a fair transition by using their own dynamics, experiences, and abilities. In other words, regional studies should be carried out within the contribution of the people of that region. A trade union perspective to adjust the transition with decent jobs and a healthy economy. Anticipating these trends and their impact on workers uh, is at the heart of trade unions activities. Uh, climate governance and related policy planning offer opportunities for trade unions to increase their understanding of the ongoing changes and their influence on climate policy. There, there, there must be measures to reduce the impact of job and livelihood loses and industry face out on workers. Such measures could include a commitment not to dismiss workers for operational reasons during a defined transition period and a right to first refusal to new jobs created in the greener economy with resettlement and other assistance if necessary. Although the social sectors contribute to the unfolding ecological and, and the climate crisis, they also play an important role in mitigating and adapting to them. The green transitions and in services, including in specific sectors such as healthcare and education, drive profound changes in energy and manufacturing. Social dialogue, trade unions must be consulted. The creation of multi stakeholders, just transition task forces, commissions, roundtables on structural change and employment that are probably constituted and probably funded. We demand that these discussions take place at company, local, national, regional, and global levels. Social dialogue should establish basic structures and ground rules. A statement of purpose says that the objective, of, uh, the objective is to implement sustainable industrial policies and just transition programs to manage the transformation of industries to the benefit of all. Establishment of a permanent institution, national observatory, permanent uh, round table, and similar. Uh, what are the mechanisms and the employment policies that should be designed around the new sectors and the opportunities that will emerge in the transformation process so that the workers who will be affected by fossil exit first benefit from the opportunities? A just transition requires joint consideration of multiple policy areas linked to the economic, 
environmental and social dimensions of sustainability. For example, macroeconomic growth policies, industrial and sectoral policies, corporate policies, the need for scale development, occupational safety and health, social protection policies, crisis and social dialogue. Labor market adjustment to programs, it will be necessary to provide workers with the skills and the cop medicines requ required by their participation in a green economy. In this context, education, lifelong learning, and active labor market policies will be fundamental. A just transition will be unlike any previous transition process. Traditional top-down labor market adjustment programs will be simply inadequate and must be replaced with worker-focused customized solutions. Labor market adjustment programs should take account of individual family and community needs and wants. Creative and worker-focused labor market policies should include an absolute right to financially and physically accessible education and the training based on the principle on the principles of lifelong uh, of, le of life learn, uh, long learning and workers' right is to choose what best mean meets their needs and wants. This would include everything from scarce training proposed by unions and implement, implemented by governments and companies and educational institutions. On the other hand, protect individuals and the communities during the transition, paying particular attention to those who are most adversely affected by changes. Strong social protection systems must be in place to ensure health, income, security, and social services. Capacity building should be provided at all levels and for all relevant actors. On the other hand, promoting a just transition towards a sustainable, low carbon economy will require enormous financial resources. In this context, public investments need to play an effective role in greening the economy. A successful transition will take a long time. Therefore, important steps should be taken in order to not uh, in order not to victimize workers, involve workers as part of the tripartite structure. Trade unions, trade union rights must be protected throughout the transformations during a defined transition period. For example, five years, the income of There is a role for collective bargaining at local, national, and global framework agreement level. Agreements must be sought that guarantee transition rights to retrain, rescale, and redeploy affected workers with the same employer, subsidiaries, and contractors. Efforts should be made to find other jobs for young people, for young workers, with the help of training specialized agencies. There should be cooperation between sectors uh, set up steering committees, for example. To conclude, a just transition must be a, tra a transition for all, and all parties must have a say in it, trade unions included. Otherwise, we will deepen the divide that unions are meant to narrow. We know that we cannot achieve the transition, this transition if we continue to grow the problem by expanding oil, gas, and, and coal production. A truly just transition raises a host of issues related to energy access, new models of modern, of more decentralized energy systems, and wider challenges of socioeconomic development. It needs to be addressed historically, and I will require, and uh, and it require, and it will require a major scaling up uh, for of international cooperation. To wrap up, trade uh, unions have a vital role to play to ensure a just transition. The first one is to propose uh, and set plans for the governments and companies to create jobs. The second one is social is a social dialogue mechanism that allowing us to use our collective bargaining strengths and ensuring a seat at the table. And third, and the third one is to build the trust and transparency between all relevant parties. So thank you. I'm sorry for being for speaking fast, but uh, due to the limitation of time. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Alfayat, and thank you for being mindful of the uh, time. Uh, şimdi, KESK adına Tarım Orkam Sen Genel Başkanı Ahmet 
Keleş'e söz vermek. On behalf of Kes, we would like to leave the floor to Mr. Ahmet Keleş. Hello. We've had very valuable speakers express very valuable opinions. So I will take shorter so that I don't have to repeat uh, what was already uttered. So my focus will be on what can be done from now on and how. First of all, we need to discuss the concepts in our minds. First of all, the fact that the ecological balance is broken is due to the fact that the nature has been uh, undermined. The society has a relation with nature without changing the production and consumption habits of the society, we will only be serving the capital. The society and the environment feed into each other. Capitalism has an unlimited monopolistic structure. Ecological crisis is the result of an accumulation. If this process continues for three more decades, the world will be no longer livable. This has been highlighted many times, but capitalism ignores to see this, to hear this because of its nature. Petroleum companies were first to go to the poles to look for petroleum when the ice started melting, and this shows the true nature of capitalism. I'd like to speak about how we should change the relationship between the nature and the society. All aspects of life are occupied by capital. All the power plants, the geothermal plants, the hydraulic plants, the shopping malls, the various figures that they use, they occupied our earth, our rivers, every field of life and capital is designing itself based on such occupation. When we fail to see this, we cannot resolve this problem. Another aspect is we have to see the fact that Turkey is in the Middle East and in this geography, we've always seen war and struggle and conflicts. Also being a nation state, we tend to get armed, which results in death, certain places being free of humans, greenhouse emissions. Also, this understanding of being the owner of natural resources is uh, a cause for an ecological crisis as well as case you know, that this understanding has uh, co uh, consequences. When we were fighting uh, the energy plants planted in Ikizdere, the state said, this is a state project. Whoever says no to this is a terrorist. Do not listen to the terrorists. We are doing good things here. They convinced the uh, local people there our colleagues were arrested, they were imprisoned. This shows the gravity of the problem. We need to highlight the social problem there because in Turkey, there's manipulation. Uh, our co-chair also expressed the fact that right after the signing of the Paris con uh, climate uh, deal, they passed a law in order to give free of charge a very large uh, forest field to capitalists. And they were con talking about the benefits of the public, such as the construction of mosques and mass housing. These are based on the cultural memory of the people and their faith as well, but it's all about exploiting nature and as well as that exploiting labor. We need to highlight these over and over again. Another aspect is green growth is a different thing 
uh, you can see the characteristics of capital and the essence of it. It's all based on destruction. With seed factories that are being monopolized, we have more and more hybrid seeds requiring more fertilizers and more chemicals. This means the carbon dioxide and nitrogen will worsen and we will have more draft and more global warming. If you don't change all the relevant relationships, you cannot get anywhere. When you look at the history of the world, you will see, you know, um, in Gebekli Tepe, in Mesopotamia, they dated back the history of humankind. Remember the deforestation here is causing us to get covered in concrete and this is contributing to this size of the problem. I think someone left their microphone on. So we need to consider the fact that our country is still getting hyper, uh, higher and higher in the rank of emission releasing countries. We are at number 16 now. And uh, we will have an increase rather than a decrease in uh, greenhouse gas emissions if it goes like this. We are actually aiming to exploit our local coal more and more. And uh, previously, my colleagues talked about what these fossil fuels uh, were causing. So I won't speak about that any further. But uh, obviously, we need some credits and we need to uh, change our manipulation here. If we are to make a transitioning, we need to have the involvement of uh, the rights of the workers. At the moment, only the capital is uh, on the forefront. We should also focus on village co councils, public councils, neighborhood councils, in order to focus on the consumption habits of the people. And we might have different examples to that. Uh, the council of a village may establish a collective in order to meet their own vegetable needs. Likewise, many farmers in Turkey, as you know, have to get indebted in order to buy a tractor and then uh, they're going to need equipment and machinery and they will use loans for that purpose, but they're not able to repay the loans. And then they had their tractors uh, uh, applied executive restraints against them and uh, uh, confiscated, which is why, you know, we need to have uh, a better organization in the future for the enjoyment of the rights of the farmers. There are many points to cover. The main uh, idea is well, are we going to change the system or the climate? That's the question we have to ask ourselves. We need to change the system and labor unions will have a really important role to play there because they're fighting for labor and as nature is being destroyed, workers are suffering more poverty, more hunger, and they have to pay for everything for forests, for water, or anything that keeps them alive. So they actually start to serve uh, the capital unwillingly. We need to see this class struggle as it is and build a network of organization to prevent this from worsening. As Kes Kesk, we believe that ecological knowledge should be enhanced by educating our children starting from primary school and everyone should understand the struggle uh, so that all the ecological dynamics can be uh, improved and so that we can enhance this uh, struggle better. We are working very hard on this, but as you said, 
there is a profitability viewpoint of capital and capital is much better at imposing its own perspective and that's why well i had prepared 15 pages but many points were covered by uh, my colleagues and uh, we have exceeded our time limit uh, i'm shortening my time uh, to show my respect thank you very much and uh, have a fruitful session. Thank you very much, Ahmed Bey. Thanks for your kindness. Perhaps you can share with us the text that you prepared. We will all benefit from it. You touched upon important points regarding the struggle and lack of justice. And we're focusing on justice here. We need to discuss how an inclusive transformation may take place so your preparations your work will be helpful so please share with us how shall i send it, send it to you so you can email it to johnson yes i'll i'll write to you after the meeting in fact i see that questions are being put in the chat box and some people left but of course, uh, the meeting is being recorded. So I think those who left will be able to see the answers from the rec records. Now I'd like to give the floor to Çetin Şanverdi from Turkish, Turkish. Well, thank you very much. I'd like to extend my greetings to all of you. Since the first industrial revolution, our planet is warming. We have natural disasters, rise in the ocean levels, there is a decrease in the plant and what uh, animal species, and of course there is increasing work stress on the employees. An international climate regime has been established to fight these problems. The first one is the Paris Climate Agreement, which was signed uh, in 2016, and uh, new targets have been established. According to uh, the Paris Agreement, we will try to keep the global warming to 1.5 degrees from the pre-industrial levels. The only way to do so is to become carbon neutral, which means that countries and companies will have to reduce their carbon emissions. We need a grand green uh, transition from in all uh, industries, including the ones uh, which pollute the greatest actually. Coal is uh, the biggest contributor to climate change among the greenhouse gases. China uh, committed to become climate neutral by 2060, Russia by 2065, US and EU by 2050, and Turkey by 2053. Therefore, we need transition in all industries, including energy. For many centuries, every new uh, technology increased the strength and power of the capital. Now, in the US, in the Western Europe, in the UK, and in the last 20 years, in China and India, which have uh, adapted to the capitalist order, uh, have the largest uh, carbon emissions. In fact, they uh, agree to this fact as well. And certain environment funds were established and uh, the funds are being released in uh, developing countries and in uh, improving new green technologies. One of them is the Global Environment Fund to which Turkey is a party. Of course, humanity will continue uh, to develop we first developed in terms of uh, mechanical revolution, then came the electrical uh, revolution, automation, and now we have digital uh, revolution. Just a transition or green transition is not a matter specific to a sector or a country. Green transformation and digitization are also hand in hand with politics. 
prevention of the climate crisis and adaptation policies require a political will from uh, developed countries. We need international mechanisms for this. If Turkey wants to remain as the part of the international capitalist movement, and by the way, by uh, ratifying the Paris Agreement, Turkey uh, once again confirmed uh, its will to become part of the capital world. Turkey will have to uh, stick to the European Union initiatives like the carbon border adjustment mechanism or the uh, EU carbon emission system, emission trading system. And uh, Turkey is also discussing to uh, price uh, carbon according to the policies of the EU. Our country is also in a leading position in terms of innovation and R&D investments. Uh, mining industry, energy and construction industries uh, are the strongest industries in Turkey. And of course, uh, adaptation to climate policies uh, will require the, those sectors to change. We need to have a national agenda for green uh, transition. Of course, carbon industry will be affected greatly by this, and uh, steel industry is another one to be affected. There are uh, some uh, reports by uh, environmental organizations like Greenpeace or change.org. However, uh, depending only on those uh, vague reports will not be enough for Turkey to develop its green transition. According to a projection by the OECD, which spans uh, 2030, uh, Turkey will suffer a 30 to 40 percent uh, employment and production loss in the coal and gas industries in transition to uh, renewable energy. But of course, for Turkey, uh, there are certain regions where the coal and energy industry is the main uh, livelihood provider. The people working in those industries in those regions will uh, suffer from economic losses, livelihood losses. The state will suffer from economic losses. Therefore, when planning a just transition, we have to have a holistic view. We have to be realistic because distorting economy in those regions will have a nationwide effect. Uh, so people will uh, migrate to big cities, and of course, this will create new social economic problems in the big cities as well. While shutting down or phasing out of old fashioned and polluting industries, uh, new industries are emerging, greener industries are emerging, but not all of them uh, can replace the uh, old industries. So it's not that five new businesses are being opened uh, to replace the ones which are shut down. And as you know, green uh, transition and technology transformation are walking hand in hand. So if we are to shut down uh, fossil fuel uh, plants or thermal power plants, uh, people suggest that we can divert that employment to agriculture and animal breeding or uh, animal husbandry. But uh, this is a just this is just a regression this is not moving forward we have to focus more on industrial sectors to get a more uh, stabilized income so how will turkey implement this transition we have 131 state universities in turkey only 11 of them are technical universities and we only have three universities in the top 500 around the world uh, there are around 13,000 high schools and only 500 of them are science schools. There is increasing youth unemployment. Uh, around 30% unregistered economy. Uh, male participation to labor force is at 71%, while female participation is only 34%. So while talking about transition to renewable energies and new greener industries, we need uh, 
different ways of employment and different skills in those industries. To cater for this need, we have to create a midterm and long-term planning by all social parties. And we also have to come up with policies and we have to find uh, the financial resources. In order to implement green uh, transition in Turkey, we also have to focus on uh, environmental justice. We also have to come up with complementary industrial, technological and employment policies. We cannot think of any other mechanism which will give us a just transition. Uh, Turkey uh, is a country which provides services to central capitalist countries and its role is like a cheap uh, labor provider actually. We import waste uh, and um, all the waste uh, that we import and all the waste generated by uh, industrial facilities uh, is treated inappropriately and uh, most of them uh, enters the seas. Hence, we have the mucilage problem in the Marmara Sea. That's why we have to make uh, very careful calculations about how much employment will be lost because of transition to new industries. And maybe we can uh, identify some pilot cities and industries uh, to develop plans for a just transition. Of course, uh, this brings about new challenges. Let's give an example from the uh, carbon sector, from the coal sector. We have coal mines in Turkey and to re-establish uh, the coal miners in other industries, they have to be uh, trained. But um, after the age of 30, maybe 35, uh, I do not believe that the training they will uh, go through will be very effective. And we cannot ask them to work in the agricultural or uh, animal husbandry industries as well, because uh, this is uh, just regression in terms of social and economic terms. And another idea, another suggestion is to ask those who are getting closer to the retirement age to retire earlier, actually. But how are we going to uh, cover that cost? Are we going to cover it from the central budget? Because if we uh, allocate that money to uh, compensate for early retirement, then uh, we won't have any money left for other disadvantaged society uh, segments of the society. I think the costs should be met by the uh, central uh, capitalist countries who are the real uh, creators of the climate crisis. The private sector needs uh, people to maximize their profit. Also, uh, the state should come up with social policies and instruments to help people to adapt to the uh, changing needs. I think uh, another policy uh, choice can be uh, direct support and benefits uh, provided by the state. You have two minutes left. Okay. So let's have a look at the coal sector in Turkey. Uh, in Turkey, um, 37% of electricity is generated by using coal and 22% of electricity generation depends on natural gas. In fact, uh, majority of the people employed in the energy sector work uh, in the coal industry. So I think when designing a just transition and phasing out of coal, we have to think of uh, the risks, uh, and demographic structures and factors as well. We do not have a, a single solution uh, for all problems actually, because um, the risks, costs, opportunities uh, to be brought about by just transition uh, will differ from one region to another. On the other hand, in order to prom promote uh, an economy, 
uh, which is a low carbon economy, uh, we will have to uh, bear other costs. As trade unions, we are ready to do our best to contribute to developing plans. So the priority of uh, green transition or just transition should be to develop a fair uh, working conditions for both uh, female and male workers. And workers should be included in decision-making processes. And we also have to fix the problem of global balance. We are living in times where unemployment rates are very high and the rate of organization is very low. Therefore, uh, in order to have a just transition, we have to include uh, trade unions in this process. Well, thank you very much for your attention and sorry about uh, extending my the time limit. Well, thank you very much. It's been a long meeting and we heard very important remarks and questions keep coming on the chat box. And I believe that some of these questions were answered by the previous speakers, but I'll give the floor back to Johnson now. Well, thank you, Bengisu. By the way, we are half an hour behind our agenda. Let's take 15 more minutes to answer the questions. But before, I'd like to thank our interpreters, Esin Aslan and Özge Gündüz. Uh, we can ask them to leave now because we've already exceeded our time. <laughs> Uh, 